Funding for the Stoller Report is made possible by a grant from the First American Title Insurance Company of New York. The First American Corporation is the nation's leading diversified provider of business information products and services that impact the major events of people's lives. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller, the host of the Stoller Report, Real Estate Trends in the Tri-State Region. The topic of today's program is residential housing in New York. My guests include Judy Calagaro, Commissioner of the Housing uh, and Community Renewal, New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal. Uh, Jane Gladstein, a partner of Metropolitan Housing Partners. Uh, Christopher Daly, President of the Sheldrick Organization. And last but not least, David Levine, uh, Vice President of Davison Partners and President of Wolf Management. At dinner, I was uh, saying that I grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, I, I grew up uh, probably in something that we call a tenement. Uh, it was right across the street from Jefferson High School, and it was a four-story walk-up, you know, perhaps with an ice box or something like that. And I, and I grew up in this apartment until I was probably three years of age. And at three years of age, uh, my family moved to probably, um, Donald Trump would probably not talk about it, but it was the first development uh, that his father had developed, a property called um, Beach Haven. It was on, um, off the Belt Parkway, and it was like a 35 complex building, grass and everything, six stories, um, the uh, the fire escapes were our terraces, and you know this was uh, the way I grew up, and it, the neighborhoods have changed. That neighborhood was always a nice neighborhood, but neighborhoods have changed. I mean, a couple years ago, uh, my son, who uh, graduated college, one of his friends, um, was being taken down to the Lower East Side on Ludlow Street, and uh, his parents said, "Ludlow Street." Our parents fought for years to get out on Ludlow Street. And what has happened? Housing in New York, anywhere in New York, is very important. Uh, and it's very expensive. Um, there was an article on November 13th in, a, in the new pu newspaper called AM New York. It says, New York sky high rents. To all of the New Yorkers who ever wondered why half their checks go to rent, the economists say they have an answer. It's restrictive zoning laws, community action groups, and costs. The current, this keeps the current system of new housing units demand at a price that's skyrocketing. The system is Byzantine. T today, we're very fortunate. I have the Commissioner of Housing, who will tell us a little bit about housing, and I have, a, I have two developers of market rate, who I really consider not market rate. I consider it luxury, because what's market rate? And then I have someone over here who is an affordable housing developer, a senior housing developer. So we have a different perspective. What's happening in New York? Do we have affordable housing? Can somebody who's making $35,000 or $50,000 find an apartment in the five boroughs of New York? Jane? I think that they can. I think that it's um, increasingly challenging for pr the private development community to be able to source land at a reasonable price that is zoned appropriately to create housing product. Uh, we are a very downtown-centric company. Um, very little of the land we look at downtown is zoned for residential. So that means that we're going to make a deal to acquire a piece of land and then we're going to potentially spend half again the cost of that piece of land, if not double the cost of that piece of land, to get it entitled, to get it rezoned so that we're permitted to build housing there. So if, if, you, if you're permitted to build housing, I mean, my question is, can somebody who's earning in what I call a middle income afford to, to be in your buildings? I, 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 it sounds impossible. I, most New Yorkers probably could not afford to be in the buildings that we're building. Okay, what, but, what Jane, but Jane's only doing 
uh, condominium projects. But no, wait, Jane, Jane also, her, her first development was one on 30th Street and 2nd Avenue. No, it was actually on Bowery and Spring Street oh, right. okay. in Olita. But that was and a rental. That was a rental. And 80, 20 or straight? Straight rental, market rate rental. And at the time, a studio apartment was renting for 1900 to $2,000 a month. I would, I would not consider that affordable for the overwhelming majority of New Yorkers. For our viewers, uh, affordable by definition by the uh, uh, HUD, HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Organization, says affordable housing to someone means 30% of their income can be spent for housing. So therefore, if someone is earning fifty thousand dollars a year, thirty percent of fifty thousand is fifteen thousand. That means twelve hundred and fifty dollars a month is what the rent should be under the affordable. Right, Judy? Correct. Okay. Now, there's a, stir a survey saying that in New York, more than fifty percent of people who are living in apartments in market rate apartments are possibly spending fifty percent of their income to afford that, okay? The, the, the big question that has gone and happened over the years is that New York, as opposed to certain other cities in the nation, has had extensive rent regulations. It began in the late 30s when they started rent control. That stayed until 1974 when they went rent stabilization. And then there was another rent stabilization change in 1993, and then, and then 1997, and recently rent stabilization was continued again. The articles say, and the Steve Spinola, the, the head of the, uh, the Real Estate Board of New York, says, let's get rid of rent stabilization, let's get rid of this deregulation, let's change the zoning situation, let's build, because if we built, we'd be able to, we'd be able to give people more homes. I mean, you've built here. How long does it normally take you to get something accomplished, to get it zoned, to, to start from the beginning to the finish? If you, if, you, if you pick a project that's not zoned correctly, it could take you two, three years. If you pick something as a right, you're, you know, automatically it's a two-year building process. Uh, you know, when, when he says, you're, you're looking at people that there's no middle ground. You're looking at people who are either, you know, the rent controller, rent stabilizer has been in their apartments for, Year, you know, 30 years, and you know they're paying you know thousand dollar for rent, and you're looking at the high end people who are paying four thousand. There's no middle <coughs> right, middle but, ground but you know, anymore. But here's here's the interesting thing: many of those people who are in those rent stabilized units don't want to ever leave right. because they have such a great rent. Uh, yeah, okay, as a developer, you know, I love. Uh, and as a developer, you know, you you you're glad for rent stabilization because. It, it, it creates a shortage of housing that the, mar the apartments that you bring onto the market, you could charge a higher rent and you'll get that because people need places to live. All the people that are coming into the city, the people that can't afford the, you know, uh, who are in the $85,000, $100,000, $100,000 income level, they're now competing for a, sh a small level of apartments because, you know, as people recognize the regulations and the, and the, uh, the rent control, rent stabilization is creating, is not opening up all these apartments, people are staying there for 30 or 40 years, creating but, a but shortage wait, that which, helps it, out the Which we enjoy as condominium developers because it's that choked supply conduit that fuels the demand side of the equation and allows purchasers to pay more for their housing because there's just not enough of it for them but, to take advantage of. But you know, I, I think part of the reason why people are buying apartments is that we had a mortgage rate, we've, we've seen a mortgage rate at 6%, which is the lowest in 40 years. So you Even take. Less. Okay, it's, you know, it's under 6%, right. okay? It reached under 6%. So when you take into consideration that you can afford, okay, to rent, to buy as opposed to rent, it pays. I mean, especially for the two of you over here, I know that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Well, people started to compare what they were paying in rent to what they would be paying in a mortgage, and they realized with the lower interest rates that it was affordable. And so co-ops and condos became more in vogue again in the last... 12 months, well, 18 I also th months. I think there's another dynamic, which is that the stock market was, and to a certain extent is, so volatile that people were concerned about leaving their money there, and there was essentially <coughs> a version of flight capital, fleeing the stock market and investing in a more solid, stable, traditionally relied upon asset like real estate, and people began investing in their homes in a way that they might not have otherwise 
in the middle 90s when the market was thriving. Regardless of interest rate, it was simply a safe haven for their money and still is. If you, if you look at the um, appreciation levels historically in New York real estate, they're quite extraordinary. And again, the choked supply conduit only drives those values even higher up. And, and the people who are buying condominiums today are, are really very savvy. And they understand that they're not just buying a home, they're buying an investment, and they're looking for that investment to appreciate. So it's not the Dow Jones. They, they're saying, you know, as opposed to the Dow going over there, or golf, but there's something else will be into a, a piece of property. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think there was the movie The Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, and Duddy, uh, Richard Dreyfuss starred in it, and his grandfather said, you buy real estate, you buy real estate, uh, okay? And, you, you know, that's, that, that's the concept. I, you know, at, at dinner, I was asking uh, about the subject of how a builder can build in New York. And for our, uh, uh, for our viewers, um, there are certain terms and certain items that, you know, nuances that people don't understand. Uh, something is called a 421A uh, certificate. Okay, and something is called inclusionary housing. Um, now, both of you have recently built, uh, Davis and Partners uh, have, over the last 10 years, uh, developed about five rental buildings. Yes. Five rental and about another six. Yeah, six, six, five six, rental, six, uh, six condos. Six condos, okay? Now, if you weren't able, okay, the 421A is a certificate that allows you a tax abatement for 10 years, being phased in over 10 years. Correct. Okay? Now, that means that the individual who's going to buy that unit is not going to pay taxes the first year, and that the tax is going to be o over the 10-year period of time. Yeah, they, they pay a very minimum tax. They pay a minimum taxes. Okay? So the, their assessment is lower. Well, the their assessment, assessment is stays the same. The same. Right. It's abated. Right. It's so exempt. The, so the assessment stays the same. Okay? And essentially, you know, they're going in there and their maintenance. Okay, when somebody is assuming, you know, as you say, the, the investment you have, you have your, you have your uh, mortgage, your interest in principal, and then you have your common area charges, and then you have your taxes. And if you if you have a 421A certificate, you don't have any taxes. Well, you have lower yeah, taxes, taxes. Right. But not as high. As you're saying, the, the consumer, you know, the, the purchaser is very savvy. As soon as one developer does it. And they m lower the monthly co carrying costs, you know, between your mortgage, your maintenance, and your taxes. The next developer has to do it because he has to compete, and it's become a, it's become a case where you can't have you can't not have it. Okay, and how? Okay, and, and this is a question uh, for, for Chris and for Judy. How does someone get a 421A certificate? Do, do we buy it at uh, at Altman's, which <laughs> is the old building? Okay, uh, I mean. You know, I know it's a lead-in question, but <laughs> the, what, why does somebody get in a 421A? What, what, what is somebody doing to get a 421A certificate besides paying money? Well, it's a city-run program. It's a benefit available through the city of New York. And so basically the developer is going to be working with the people from the city to arrange for their certificate, but in place of that, they're going to provide a unit of affordable housing, possibly in another location in the city. Okay, so on the average, okay, for our viewers to understand that when someone gets a certificate and somebody can move into this luxury middle market or a luxury building, someone else, the certificate has been created by an affordable housing, perhaps in uh, the Bronx or Staten Island, they have Queens, sure, okay, sure. okay, and and that's basically how the certificates have been Operating created, again. correct? Okay, and the affordable housing certificate that that person, that person would be moving into this apartment, be it in the Bronx or in Brooklyn or even in Manhattan, in certain sections of Manhattan, okay, and that that tenant would be paying what type of rent? The affordable housing tenant. It depends, and chances are that there will be some additional layering of financing, affordable housing financing on top of that, that will make that project affordable 
to the population in that community. So it depends on the location, and it depends on where your additional financing let, is going to come from. You've done a number, you know, in your role as the commissioner. Okay, you've done a number of projects uh, over the state. Okay, in the generally year. speaking, we're looking to serve people at or below sixty percent of median income. Okay. And typically, what, you're what is what is median income? Rent, rent would be six hundred dollars for a one bedroom. Seven hundred. Yeah, six to seven hundred and fifty yeah. would be our range. Reasonable. Okay, in, so, in the so outer boroughs. and that would well, be and that and Chris, that would be the thirty percent rule. So yes. If, okay, so six hundred. I don't have my calculator here. If we took six hundred dollars a month times twelve, that's seventy two hundred. That would equate to thirty percent in the income. So the person's earning approximately twenty one thousand or less. Or, or twenty one thousand dollars or less, and they would get that apartment, and, and that w that's based on the number of uh, individuals, the individuals in the family. Correct. How many mm -hmm. children? Okay. In December, Mayor Blumberg uh, came out with this uh, statement that he's going to be building. Uh, the, you know, New York is going to be building thirty eight thousand units of affordable housing. Where are they going to be built? Well, we're going to help them. Okay. We just announced funding today for some projects that will be in metropolitan New York area, and we're going to be using the federal tax credit that's allocated to the state by the federal government, along with some of our state program funding through our Housing Trust Fund Corporation, and some other programs that we kind of mix and match. And we're going to do uh, about 1,200 units of additional housing. And in where, where are these? The city. Where are they going to be? Uh, a lot of them are going to be in the Bronx, I'll tell you that. Uh, certainly some are in, in Manhattan, uh, primarily in Upper Manhattan or in the Harlem neighborhoods, and some in Queens. North of 96th or north of 110th? Probably north, north of 110th. Um, and are these going and, to, are we'll these going to be, are these going to be rental or are they going to be sale? Because I know that the city has certain programs where they can do sale units of affordable housing, New Hop and so The on. majority of these are going to be rental. However, we are working with some nonprofit organizations that are doing some home ownership initiatives. But the majority of those 1,200 units will be, will be rental. Okay. So I, I just want to follow the flow for our audience. So these affordable housing units are going to be built north, north and upper Manhattan, the boroughs or certain other things. Affordable housing is going to be created. With that affordable housing, okay, <coughs> with that 421A certificate, David, for his new property perhaps on uh, 55th Street off Madison Avenue and Park Avenue, uh, and Jane, uh, I don't think you, do you need that in your Soho project? Um, we're, we're as of right um, in Soho and we're as of right at 505 Greenwich because they're both south of Housen Street. So you don't need the certificate for that. But on, when you did the 30th Street project, we okay. do need certificates. Okay, and we you would did use the certificate. Them. Okay, so that way the, the certificate would provide the tax yeah. situation. Yes. Yeah. Well, what about this concept? Uh, what's inclusionary? Inclusionary is a type of way to increase your FAR. Uh, you know, by increasing your building size, usually uh, you acquire air rights from a contiguous lot. With inclusionary. You require, you acquire the air rights. It doesn't have to be a contiguous lot. It could be a lot within a community board or within a certain number of blocks of the site. Uh, typically, the inclusionary is, is, is done th because the building is a not-for-profit building uh, that is only... That's, a, that's an offsite inclusionary sometimes. An offsite inclusionary that's not built up to their allowable FAR, and you, take, and you transfer that you, you know, to another so, site. So when you, when you build the inclusionary somewhere else, you're also, as a developer, able to build additional units in your building. Yes, you're so, able to go up. So there. even if the land cost, like uh, in, I believe it was yesterday in City Feet, analyzed, mentioned that there was a, a lot sold on Crosby Street, um, and basically <coughs> they said the lot was sold for $120 a development foot. Um, We'd, we would be delighted to find land <laughs> priced at $120 a square foot on Crosby Street. Um, that's that's a really extraordinary land price in today's environment in a neighborhood like Soho. Chris, you know you're you're not building market rate. You know you you've taken properties that have uh, had some difficulties over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, what what do you do up in Mount Vernon? 
Um, well, we took a failed housing authority project that was under the auspices of um, the Mount Vernon Housing Authority. Um, we put about um, forty thousand dollars per unit into each apartment, new bathrooms, new kitchens, um, lots of security, um, and renovated every single one of those apartments, five hundred units, and then re-rented. And, and we've who, changed and people's quality tenants? of life. The typical people who are in Mount Vernon, working class people. No, no, I mean, I mean it wasn't a senior housing. No, no, family housing. But what these projects do, and as Judy mentioned before, with state and city financing, these outer borough projects in places like Mount Vernon are really not outer borough, but they've created whole new neighborhoods and have, have rejuvenated neighborhoods that in the 70s and 80s we'd all drive by and say, my gosh, what's going on there? Why does this look that bad? So, yeah, people have I mean, been priced out of New York. You, you love Hempstead. But, I, I mean, but Hempstead, look, you know, once was uh, the headquarters of A&S and had all the shopping over there, mm -hmm. and then Hempstead was considered, you know, one step of the Mount Vernon or, mm -hmm. you know, it was... Same thing. Yeah, same sure. thing. But what you've done in, in Hempstead is you've built affordable or senior housing. But look, affordable housing in all these communities has turned these places around. Judy's programs, city programs, look at downtown Brooklyn, look at the outer sp uh, spots east of downtown Brooklyn, um, look at large sections of the Bronx now where people are living where they hadn't built up the city's tax assessment rolls. Um, so people get priced out of New York. Um, but there are whole new neighborhoods and, all, and whole new tax bases that have been built up because of this uh, new housing Through over the last few years. that type of renovation, you can make that neighborhood a very desirable place for people to live. You've, in, you've in improved the quality of life. You've improved the security of the neighborhood. Uh, in the Mount Vernon project, um, we've also done quality of life items through rehabilitation of the entranceway to the buildings uh, to uh, expand to improve, to make it a much more uh, pleasant environment for the children and the families that live there. And then you n don't just deal with the built environment by working around uh, the project itself, by doing some things with landscape architect architecture, you can really improve the grounds in, in uh, those areas as well. So it's been um, a big boost to that neighborhood in Mount Vernon. I've seen the same types of things going on in New York City as well not so much with public housing, but with other existing housing that's been renovated. What happened renovated. to it? You know, and, and that's an interesting topic. There were housing built in Mount Vernon. There were housing built in Brooklyn, Coney Island, other areas. Um, and they fell into ruins, okay? Fortunately, due to the, you and the state and other agencies, you've put money in to renovate them, to make them quality. What happened? Did the developer who built the unit walk away from them? In, in some cases they did. In, in some cases they could no longer afford the upkeep on the property or they weren't paying their taxes. I mean, we see that in real estate all across the state, all across the, the nation. It's not just unique to New York. Um, no, but I, I'm really looking at the, at the <coughs> residential because, you know, Chris, looking at the, your website, which is very interesting, Sheldrick Sheldrick.com. You, you see, Chris has done a number of these. I think he did one up in Tonawanda or, uh, and other areas with similar problems, okay? The, the property fell into disrepair. There was a need to, to renovate it. You took it over. I mean, I've been to your properties in Hempstead. Uh, they're, they're gorgeous, and your, your tenants love it. We've walked through there and, and spoken to them. But my, my, my reason for the question really relates to the subject of um, regulations. Um, I think everyone uh, watching and sitting here would be surprised that uh, in New York City, uh, by a study in 1999 uh, by the Manhattan Institute and the Housing Survey Estimate, stated that nearly three-quarters of all New York City renters receive some form of rent subsidy or have their rents regulated. 71.6% uh, in New York. Um, the U.S. average of subsidy is only 66% all forms of subsidy. And, um, you know, it's one of the highest rate. Uh, 
has rent regulations, stymied developments, has rent regulations cre created problems in New York City, rent well, stabilization. Well, first of all, don't most of us have some type of subsidy? I mean, every year when I, I own my own home, <coughs> but when I fill out my tax return each year, I know that I'm getting something back no, from the I, federal I, I, government. I'm not talking about that subsidy. I'm talking more of a rent control subsidy or rent stabilization, which is what David uh, alluded to before. Somebody staying in their apartment because they don't want to leave. Now, when David and Jane build, even though they build new on your rentals, when you build new rentals, okay, even though they were brand new, they were also under the stabilization law. Correct. Because if they received the 421A certificate, a tax certificate, they had to go into the rent stabilization law. What, what has happened is that there are these tenants who don't want to leave. You know, they want to inherit their apartments. They want to find the next relative and all this. But there are tenants who are paying $1,000 a month for a two-bedroom if they're in the apartment long enough. Yes. Okay? Now, taking in... Of the 71.6 percent that I mentioned before, 54 percent is rent regulated. Okay, public housing is only five percent. Uh, subsidies, which we spoke about, is only 10 percent. It's rent regulation. Now, um, I think some of my viewers and, and you would remember in July they renewed the rent stabilization rules. Any idea why? I, I Fully believe it's the it's the tenant group. I, I think that I, I think their 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 voices are misdirected. I mean, if they if they thought about the problem and they think that instead of protecting the people that are there and they're out looking for housing as a whole, then they would they would try to get rid of these regulations. Housing prices would come down. More housing would go up. More renovations would get done. If you weren't if an if an owner of a, a building wasn't locked in. To the amount of money that they could increase, or the amount of money they could get for an apartment, if they were, if they did not let the market, if they did, were not helped by the market, th there's no incentive to do repairs. There's no incentive to upkeep the building. There's no incentive to 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 build a new, or to you know, to, to, to efforts to knock down a site and build a new but, piece but of wait, housing. But uh, wait, under under the rent rules, if you did major a major capital improvement, you were able to get this in over 40 months. You're getting in over 40 you know, months, you can, yes. You can apply 2.5%. Yes, it, it can, it, but it's not... Uh, but it's still not so, profit. It, it, yeah, it's and money. It's, it's, it's the cost, and, and I, I completely agree with you. Right. I think that, it's not profit. that rent regulation is, to a large extent, stifling the creation of new housing within New York City, and um, the economics of development here are such that um, I can tell you that most development companies of our size cannot look at a new development today as a rental. Overwhelmingly, we look at transactions as condominium housing. And that's, that's largely a function of the cost to build here and the fact that ultimately the asset you build will be constrained, your ability to operate it in a free market environment. And I think that if we did not have rent regulation, the supply conduit could potentially loosen up, which, which I agree would absolutely serve to drive the prices down. You know, it's very interesting. You know, people say, how does somebody, you know, how does someone get out of rent controls? Or, I mean, rent controls, the buildings had to be built pre-1944. So the rent controls are very limited today. Rent stabilization rules were enacted uh, in the early 50s and then really 1973, 1993, and 1997. But they changed the rules in 97. Okay, in 1993, they said you can get an apartment deregulated. And for our audience, uh, deregulated means market rent is what David yeah. mentioned before. You can get an apartment deregulated if the tenant living in the apartment had earned a quarter of a million dollars for two years prior to that. So if you were a very aggressive landlord or, you know, you did some research, you were able to do it. In 1997, and I, I, th I don't think the economy went that bad, they changed that rule that you could get it deregulated if you were earning 175. So they reduced it, so they helped it for the landlord to get rid of it. The only problem is when they renewed the rent re regulations, the stabilization in July, they renewed it at the same price and they haven't taken in any inflation over the years. 
So over all these years, there hasn't been any inflation. There hasn't been anything really happening. Well, I'm sure that the family that's earning $21,000 a year does not perceive that an individual earning $175,000 a year is in need of a housing subsidy. Right. But the person earning $21,000 a year, okay, due to the efforts of the state, due to the efforts of the federal government, is able to get a Section 8 certificates in many cases? Or, or to reside in one of our uh, developments that we've financed with tax credits or the New York State Housing right. Trust Fund Without program. Without, a, without Section 8. Without Section 8. Like we, our building in Staten Island you can move into today. No Section 8. Pay 650. Right. Judy financed that. Okay. Now, your building in Staten Island, they pay 650. What if their income is less than 30 percent? Can they receive a certificate or a voucher? They could if they applied. But the, the vouchers are very hard to get in New York City. Um, yeah, that's that's a big subject of controversy today. You know, and a lot of communities don't want people with Section 8 to come in. So Jane's run into this before. There's people who don't want it. NIMBYism still runs rampant. Um, but um, there are programs out there that can protect these people. And I think with, um, with stabilization, it has helped rejuvenize, rejuvenate some of these um, out-of-borough communities. Again, like the Bronx and, and Brooklyn, and it will keep going. And if you stop it, if you take it out altogether, I think you would see first-class developments being built in the Bronx and in Queens and perhaps even Staten Island. You know, in 1961 and 62, Sam Lefrak, who's always been considered a visionary, built all these apartments, uh, Lefrak City, the Marseilles, and some other buildings. And people were paying their $300, maybe at that time $150, and then the rents went up. And certain people three years ago were paying $1,000 a month. Now, an apartment for our viewers that is less than $2,000 a month is under rent stabilization laws. Today, close to 40% of those apartments are no longer rent stabi stabilized. What do, you, do, you, do you know how, how this happened? <coughs> but look at that neighborhood. No, 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 please. But, no, the way it happened, okay, <laughs> the me. neighborhood, the, the way it happened is that if a tenant moves out under law, you can get a 20% vacancy increase. So if the apartment was $1,000, you can get another 20% immediately to make it $1,200. If you improve that apartment, of course, daily improvement like you did up in Mount Vernon, and you spend $40,000, <coughs> you can allocate that also. So an apartment that was, let's say, thirteen, fourteen hundred right now can be destabilized. And, and it, that... It's yes. also possible that that unit hadn't received any substantial renovation because it had been occupied. You, you just mean it was said, a 1936 Amana? Well, and and you, they didn't put a sub-zero like uh, my friends over here. In, in your words, not mine, but you said that the tenants were probably likely to have lived there for a long time. So to make those types of renovations to an apartment like that might be quite appropriate. I mean, if we're putting $40,000 a unit into a public housing facility in Mount Vernon or in many of our uh, uh, projects, we've done gut rehabs in, in New York where we're putting that and then some into okay. some of the rehabs that we do. We also have to consider the quality of life for the tenants and how to make improvements to keep, uh, keep that neighborhood whole as well. Right. And are those neighborhoods better now than in 1975, 1980? I would say they are. Queens? There's, uh, there's I'd no say question they, you know, the, the rents are a little higher. And the quality of life is better. Yeah. Um, and the buildings look, they're fabulous buildings. They look great. They've been renovated. Um, is that a bad thing? I think it's excellent. I'm, you know, I'm an advocate of, uh, you know, getting rid of It's a rhetorical the, question, but okay. is it a bad thing? <laughs> no. Uh, Many people have heard of uh, Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, and this, these uh, buildings which are on the uh, east side from, I think, uh, 14th Street uh, to 21st Street uh, were built in the uh, probably 1951, right, right after the war, uh, beautiful, you know, grass uh, parks and uh, amenities and everything. 
They never had air conditioning, which is what you were saying before. They didn't have. They didn't have enough electrical power. They, they, they had to do everything. And these units were, are, were and presently are still owned by Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember moving into Manhattan, and I know people always wanting to get on these lists, you know, to, to get into those buildings. You know, they really wanted to get into these buildings. And all of a sudden, they renovated the apartments, like Judy said before. But they spent probably not 40000 they probably spent $80,000. So they put new windows, they put new roofs, they, 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 they completely changed the buildings. And of the 13,000 units over there, which at one time were 13,000 rent-regulated units, rent-stabilized units, today you probably only have 3,000. But in the city of New York, you rent buildings. You, you, what's what's a one bedroom unit going in f in your building? About three thousand. Three thousand. You can go to Stuyvesant Town, or Peter Cooper Village. You can probably get a two bedroom, two bath, in the range of twenty four hundred. So you're getting a nice product, and that I think relates to the fact of getting rid of stabilization, of putting the money in and making the property. Yeah. A little better. I don't think you can confuse someone like Peter Cooper Villa, Stuyvesant of Town, with an owner like MetLife, with someone who, who owns the, you know, six-bedroom apartment, six-apartment building on on the corner, that has in that the people are paying a thousand dollars of rent and won't throw a dime in because his return, even if he throws it in, uh, is going to be minuscule. He's not going to put any money in it because he can't raise the rents that much. Well, MetLife did the same thing. They wouldn't put any money into it. That's why people didn't have air conditioning. So it, it's the but same they, thing. You have, right. you have to give someone an incentive to put the money in and the to take it out. The incentive is, you know, there's certainly enough, uh, you know, in my opinion, enough vacancies in MetLife for them to recoup some of their investment. I mean, at, at, at Cooper Village or Stuyvesant in town. Nobody leaves these apartments. There's no incentive to, to fix up the hallways, no incentive to fix the stairs. As long as they're above code, you know. No, but MetLife made a commitment, and they, they did everything. They, they did that for all their buildings, okay? And they said eventually, you know, certain people will move out or will try to buy them out of their apartment or something else, and they move. Sure. And, and these assets are 15, 60 years old. Judy and I have seen this uh, plenty right, of times. But you know what? How do you, how do you fix a 50- or 60-year-old building, 70-year-old building, without substantial renovation? Do you want you to need, tell me what these the two people would do? They well, would knock different. them down and build something new. <clears throat> well, I yeah, mean, uh, Not necessarily. I think, right. you know, think about why we have rent stabilization. It's essentially a consumer protection piece of legislation that said we want to make sure that the residents in, in this city have affordable housing. Um, arguably over time, I think, I think that it's kind of an outdated notion and it's become abused by consumer groups who believe that people earning above six figures a year are potentially in need of that kind of protection. They, there are so many housing options available to them. And I think that if, if there were more apartments destabilized, it would free up more capital to, to create more housing for middle-income families. Well, well, the groups don't look at the outer boroughs as an option. It's really the people who say, you, you mean must they can't live, leave the island? They, yeah, they can't, can't leave the island? You must live between there. 14th Street and 59th Street and in a desirable manner. Or if they're really savvy below 14th Street, that's who they're cold down the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the, is, that, is, that the, um, is that the kind of marketplace that people envisioned at the very beginning of rent stabilization? I don't think so. I don't no. think so you either. Know, but, but David brought up a point, and it says landlords getting their fair return. And that relates to probably one of the biggest topics that has, you know, it's been on the New York Times, I think, for the past three weeks, the November 2nd issue. It's the topic of leaving Mitchell Lama. Many paths, and the Times, I think, is incorrect in saying this, all bumpy. Um, Judy, you, you, your organization is involved with Mitchell Lama. Would you tell our viewers what Mitchell Lama means? Well, Mitchell Lama it was a uh, a vehicle to, to finance housing for middle-income people that provided for um, some uh, layering of subsidies that kept the rents affordable uh, to middle-income families. And many of these uh, 
these these developments, the owners, have options to opt out of the program when after twenty years. After twenty years, um, and some of them are, and some of them are choosing not to. And and we uh, supervise about two hundred and twenty Mitchell Lamas across the state, most of them in the New York City area, and we've had about twenty two of these developments in the city leave the protections provided for under the Mitchell Lama program. However, the majority of those units now are protected through rent stabilization or the tenants who are in need um, have a Section 8 voucher. I call it a sticky voucher. It's uh, an enhanced Section 8 voucher that stays with the tenant and as long as they remain in that development uh, it has this enhanced component to it. If they were to take that voucher and leave and go somewhere else, it would become a regular uh, Section 8 voucher. Okay. And then we've done some other interesting things with Mitchell Lamas. Um, I believe in that same article that you referred to in the New York Times, they also talked about a Mitchell Lama development that we supervise called Cathedral Parkway. And we're doing something that's very unique here, a little different, and we're hoping to be able to replicate it in other places. We brought in a, helped to facilitate bringing in a, a new owner, uh, Robert Nelson, who's working in a partnership way with the Tenants Association. The building needed renovation. In fact, probably about six or seven million dollars is being now invested in to Cathedral Parkway. And eventually, uh, Mr. Nelson, through his work with the Tenants Association, is going to change the ownership structure so that the tenants will own their units. So right now it's a rental? Right now it's a rental, and it will remain a rental through the rehabilitation stage. But there was a need for an infusion of new capital into the building, primarily to fix, to fix the facade of that structure, but other work was needed too. But we were in dire need of $6 million. Right. But I, I mean, f you know, from the period when Mitchell Lama was created in the, in the 60s, uh, there were about 100, I mean, you said you have over 200 properties over 220 there? 220 properties. 220. Um, you know, th there have been a number of uh, very successful conversions in the city, you know, uh, either from rentals. And then the biggest Metro Lama that I always think about is, and, and we were alluding since Chris is a Bronx boy, okay, uh, when I had relatives living in the Bronx, they would always say, we're leaving the concourse, or we're leaving Fordham Road, and we're going to Freedom Land. And Freedom Land, uh, Subsequently, was was an amusement park. Uh, I'm aging, uh, dating myself. Freedom Land was an amusement park that uh, was not Disney World, and subsequently became one of the largest Mitchell Lama projects, developments as Correct. opposed to a project. Co-op yeah. City. Co-op City. Mm -hmm. How many units is that? Over fifteen thousand units. About fifty-five thousand people live there. It is a Mitchell Lama. But it's a little bit different than most because it's a limited equity co-op Mitchell Lama. And the cooperators, the individuals there, actually own their units. Okay, so so is it a, would we call it a conduct? Is the retail owned uh, by a developer? I'm sorry, there's a cooperative. There's, no, it, there's a cooperate, there's a, there's a corporation, uh, the River is Bay it, Corporation that oversees and Manages. Is the retail co-op? Is there is a retail owned by the co-op, or is that owned by a private developer? By the co-op, there's a retail also. So the co-op also runs. Res it's primarily residential. Right, but I mean there, there's, there's schools, a supermarket. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, schools. Wait, the schools are owned by the co-op as opposed no, to New separate. York City. No, they're separate. They're part of the board but of education or correct, something. Correct, but they're they're there. I mean, it is a city. But well, you know it's what? But comparable you know, in size what, to many what, other what cities okay, in the state. What do they mean? Okay, you see, that's why I said I don't listen to the Times and all their comments, all bumpy, because what has happened over here in Cathedral is a good example right. that it wasn't bumpy. Right. Okay. In, a, in addition to that, the governor had a piece of legislation last year that passed and uh, was signed into law this past August that provides an incentive for owners of Mitchell Lama projects, developments, to stay in the program. If they choose to, municipalities can offer to Mitchell Lama owners an extended period of tax abatement up to 50 years. And so it, it provides that incentive to some Mitchell Lama owners who would, don't want to leave the program to be able to stay in the program. It's extending that tax abatement period. 
Okay, is it to the original owner or even to a new owner? I, I think that there's opportunities for there to be refinancings and, and maybe for there to be some restructuring of the ownership. Mm. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I think uh, maybe we just mentioned everybody wants to stay on the island. Uh, people forget there is a section of the island which is not on the island. You have to get there by subway or by tram. And I know that you've been very creative recently doing a project that's called Roosevelt Island. And everybody says, that's Queens. Roosevelt Island is uh, Manhattan. Manhattan. Okay. Uh, you want to tell uh, our viewers of what you recently did uh, in financing the interesting projects? If you in drive Roosevelt? up and down the FDR Drive, which I do quite a bit, um, over the last in traffic and not traffic. Yeah. Well, okay. you know, a little bit of both. <laughs> and if you're in traffic, you may, you know, look to look to your east if you're going north. And you would have noticed over the last 18 months two buildings in construction, just a few or less than 400 new units. Uh, you know, our medical institutions in New York City are second to none, and yet those medical institutions struggle along with many businesses at attracting good quality healthcare workers to come into their institutions and and also to be able to afford to live here. And so we've entered into two agreements, one with Memorial Sloan Kettering and the other one with uh, Wheel Cornell Medical um, to help to provide housing uh, for their medical staff, for their nurses, the for researchers their and researchers, their, their fellows. And in both situations, it's a very convenient place you, the tram runs along the 59th okay. Street Bridge if you want to take the tram back and forth And, and if the employee makes enough, they can go to one of David's new apartment projects on 1st Avenue or 2nd Avenue. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to talk about mm -hmm. that. Build a helicopter pad for <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And, and if they want to go one a little further, you know, the, the researchers and the very successful doctors could go down to Soho, Soho. or Greenwich Street or something like that. Correct. Right. But what you said you did some uh, creative things what what type of things did you do uh, specialized financing for these projects I, I wouldn't necessarily call the financing specialized we worked out an agreement between the Roosevelt Island Corporation and those two in, two institutions Hudson related were the were the developers and we're looking to do more business with them we have an additional seven sites so there is land and opportunity to to develop more housing on Roosevelt Island did you give them the land, or no, they signed a lease? They signed a, uh, a Roosevelt Island uh, lease. Nobody owned the. That's correct. The land is owned by the state. Correct. Okay, so it's all. Well, all <coughs> leases. it's it's really controlled by the Roosevelt Island Operating Corporation, the state Which of New York. Which we failed to tell you that the commissioner is also the head <laughs> of. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I like to say that Herb Berman is is the head of Roosevelt Island. Herbie, you are the head. He of He is the president of Roosevelt Island. He's the man. On, on site and there. a great man also, a great guy who'll be running that. Absolutely, and he's doing a great job. And he's got some great deals that we're working on. But you know what, let, let's, let, let's bring that up right now. Uh, you said there are seven sites. You know, people say there aren't enough sites around New York, okay? You, you just mentioned right now on Roosevelt Island there are like five sites available at seven least. Seven more sites. Seven, seven more sites, okay? <laughs> David Levine, yes. you're a developer. Jane Gladstone, you're a developer. Chris Daly, you're a developer even in seniors and everything else. Why aren't other people going to Roosevelt Island? They have a nice tram. They have a subway. <laughs> they have a Costco, you know, right outside. They have other amenities. It's and, what took, and what took them so many years? Roosevelt Island was developed in the late 70s, early 80s? I, I think like many other neighborhoods in the city, it became, a, it became a, a neighborhood. And the people who lived there wanted to have a say in what that development would be. Uh, for no, no, I, but well, I, I think but I think there's another reason, though, too, Judy, is that it's it's very expensive to build in New York. It's expensive, certainly, to build on Roosevelt Island, yeah. and you would have to get a certain amount of rent to recoup your investment on Roosevelt Island. And I don't think the level of rent was there yet. But what and about, I think you need what about now? Subsidy okay. and and, and we, it's we, we have, have for our, everybody. It's no, not no, for everyone. Okay. Uh, look at the increase. I mean, we've re all recently read in the paper you have great about, views. about yeah, you have dynamic views. Absolutely, and people are flocking to Staten Island too. They're, they've had a tremendous mm. increase. Staten, Staten Island, <laughs> Richmond. That's Richmond County. Right? Richmond County. Right. I mean, th no, Staten Island. Island. I, I mean, w there was just a, a big piece in the paper about the number of people over the last several years that have moved 
to Staten Island as well. And these are, they're not for everyone. It, it's either a longer commute to work if you work in Manhattan, um, or you don't have all the amenities that you have available to you if you live in Manhattan. Very, very interesting. Last show, uh, I was talking about Lower Manhattan, and I had um, Billy Rudin uh, and Caleb Coppell, Billy uh, Rudin Management, who owns five or six buildings in Lower Manhattan, and we were saying, your employees, your secretary, your administrative people live in Brooklyn and Staten Island. That's what Lower Manhattan, that's where the, the, the people live and work. Uh, Midtown Manhattan, it's Queens uh, and, and the Bronx. You know, it, it's the, uh, mm -hmm. the convenience to everything. But my question really relates. I've just created a potential opportunity. You didn't know about <laughs> Roosevelt Island, okay? Now, you build these nice apartment houses. You're on First Avenue. Mm -hmm. So forget the view over there. <laughs> Take the view over here. We'll introduce, Judy can, will introduce uh, you to Herb. They and we'll have build no on rollers. I'll be, I could be there in, uh, soon enough. Let's develop in there. We might in, in five years, just like new projects are moving further north and further and south and further east. You know, as areas open up, developers find them, and Roosevelt Island could be the next one. Uh, you know, I mean, in Manhattan, I, I you, know, you just look for a parking lot, and you say, you know there's going to be a new development. Right. Yeah. Likely a condominium these days because of the economics of buying that land and creating housing on it. And the interesting thing, I think, about the Hudson, Hudson Company's deal is that they had a built-in prospect base. Um, they knew that they had users for their product, and that made it immediately viable. Unlike... David's firm or our firm who are going to go out and look for prospects in a broader market environment. So they knew that they had a viable development going in and it gave them the impetus yeah, to create look, it. Look at AOL. I mean, somebody spent $45 million for an apartment over there. I mean, um, you know, take uh, Bloomberg's building. I think the, the, the average price is $2 million. Who's buying? I mean, you know, you two are selling units, okay? Mm -hmm. You're selling on Fifth Avenue, a new beautiful building on Fifth Avenue, like 38th Street. Um, you have uh, two other, two or three, uh, two other buildings, you know, the new building. What's the, who buys, okay? Are they uh, yuppie? Are they established? I mean, you, you got sort of two groups, and, and I think you touched on it before. Certainly the the low interest rates, if you run your your your, your amortization schedule, and has opened up a whole new class of buyers, who are now, you know, could get a ninety percent financing and still pay a low monthly cost. Uh, you know, you still have the traditional New York City buyers who, who you know, are always buying, and you know, now from Wall Street, from uh, the insurance business, from from all over. But but that new class of buyers, because of the low interest rates, I think, has has. Uh, has introduced people to condominiums that would never think about buying before. I think is you had foreigners too. I, people yeah. from actually, the not not as safe money. Not as much as you think. We we have found we've been pleasantly surprised to find that um, both in Soho and in Kipps Bay, um, more than fifty percent of our buyers come from finance, insurance, and real estate. Uh, in Soho, they're generally between thirty and forty-five. In Kipps Bay. Um, it's a it's a slightly older demographic. Um, they might uh, not find Soho as appealing. What, what do you feel? <laughs> Greenwich Street. We have a remarkably broad product mix for a downtown building. We we have first time buyer type one bedrooms, um, which in the downtown context means one bedrooms running from half a million dollars potentially to as high as eight or nine hundred thousand um, dollars, which would obviously be a more luxurious, larger one bedroom home. Um, we've got two bedrooms that will be ideal for families who need a little more space, kind of a baby maybe apartment perhaps. Um, but we've also got two bedrooms that are perfect for a move down by or coming back into the city after they've sold their home in the suburbs. They're almost 2,000 square feet. And we also have created real family homes down there, um, drawing on the many neighborhoods that surround us. One of the great things about Hudson Square is that it's at the nexus of Tribeca, Soho, and the West Village, and really draws the best of what all those neighborhoods are about. So it's given us an opportunity to create a very dynamic product mix for a downtown, a downtown building. And we expect that we're going to have everybody from um, a young professional just starting out who, 
who's been saving their pennies and doesn't want to spend it on rent any longer, to very well established families who are familiar with and really enjoy the neighborhood and would like to be living there in a service and amenity rich environment. I think people are finding the city is a more, you know, as a, as a better place to live now, you know, especially uh, with the drop in crime and, and, and everything that's been I happening. Think, over I, the past. I think the past two mayors have done a great job. I think the governor has done a great job. New York, you know, uh, unfortunately, 9-11 uh, put a little damper on rents and the, uh, the economy uh, when the, uh, high t the tech boom, which cut your rents. On mm -hmm. your buildings, and you know, did some it, it impacted yeah. rents, and I think um, in the short term it impacted um, for sale values. Um, but I think within six months we started to see prices yeah, um, recover I, I and mean, indeed it, start yeah, booming. The latest and, study, and yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, okay. the study recently issued by uh, Douglas Elliman and uh, Miller Samuels said that uh, we've reached the highest uh, price point uh, on the sale of a unit in, in Manhattan. Uh, to like seven hundred and forty dollars for now, uh, f a foot for now. For now, yeah. I know, I know. You got to pay that financing <laughs> cost. Right. Okay, We're coming back. Judy, what do you, what do you see happening? Um, you know, with uh, the the mayor's program, with the governor's uh, new programs, with regard to new housing in the in the uh, five boroughs. We're, we're going to have a struggle in the coming years because we're running out of available land, land that is affordable. We've relied for the longest time on uh, accessing land that the city had available through their NREM or their tax foreclosure program, and much affordable housing has been built on that. And so if you shift over to the market l rate land uh, deals, we're looking at... Uh, much greater expense um, where more money is going to have to be put into the acquisition price. We're looking right now at publicly owned land that's underutilized that we can maybe tap and we're going to have to be looking at some additional rehab. Uh, although I, I just heard recently that there's going to be a new lead bill in New York and I think we're going to have to take a look at that and see what kind of impact that will have well, well, on uh, our for, ability for, to... For our, uh, Viewers, what, what do you mean by a lead bill? There's the city is looking at um, actually it's it's a city bill, not a state bill, but they're looking at modifying the laws. It relates to the elimination of lead in when we look at rehabilitation of existing housing. We're possibly looking at older units where there is lead paint, and so mm. I think that that's going to have an impact on our ability to do some rehabilitation. Okay. Um, our time is coming uh, short. Um, I think we've uh, touched on a lot of the topics uh, relating to the state of residential housing in, uh, in New York and the tri-state region. Um, I hope that perhaps in the months ahead uh, some of you will come back and we can talk about it again. Um, I really appreciate everyone uh, helping me tonight. Our commissioner, uh, Judy Calagero, uh, our developers, uh, Jane Gladstein, uh, David Levine, and uh, Chris Daly. Uh, next month, uh, we change our focus from residential to uh, large commercial office buildings, including uh, one that really you know, was very inexpensive. Well, we're going to have the, uh, the, recent, the new owner of the GM building uh, that he purchased for a uh, near $1.4 billion. Um, uh, thank you for all being here, and uh, see you next month. Funding for the Stola Report is made possible by a grant from the First American Title Insurance Company of New York. The First American Corporation is the nation's leading diversified provider of business information products and services that impact the major events of people's lives.